another live worship service for July 12th, 2020. Let's open the service with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Holy One of mystery and power, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below, keeping covenant and steadfast love with all who walk before you with pure and upright hearts. Fill our lives with your glory as you filled the temple with cloud when Solomon first brought the ark into your holy dwelling place. Give us the strength and the power to withstand the forces of evil at work in our lives and in our world today. Amen. Okay, kiddos, I've got a children's message for you. Not a lot of big props, but I do have one little prop, so i got to bring it close to you. What does this look like to you? That's right. It's a wedding band. Actually, it's my wedding band. And <clears throat> partners will get together, and they will get married, and they will make a promise. And this ring is a symbol to show that what they promised during their marriage ceremony, um, they would keep those promises so that the relationship would stay intact. And they put the ring on each other's fingers, and they make these solemn vows or these covenants with each other, these promises with each other to love during sickness and health when everything's going great and when things go wrong. Now the problem with humans is that when we make promises, sometimes we don't keep those promises. Sometimes moms and dads get divorces. Sometimes we say we promise our parents that we're going to do something and we forget. So we break our promises. But you know who never breaks his promises? is God. God uses a really cool word, which I just told you just a second ago. I don't know if you caught it or not, but God uses a cool word in the Bible for creating a covenant or a, making a promise to us. So God in heaven makes a promise to us, human, human beings. Isn't that cool? And the, the amazing thing is, is that God never breaks his promises. So we made a promise long, long ago, thousands of years ago, a covenant with Noah. You remember Noah and the ark? Well, God made a promise to Noah, a covenant with Noah, that he would never again flood the entire world um, with water. He would never again do that. And to show that he would keep his promise, he showed a symbol of a rainbow. So every time we see a rainbow in the sky, we should be reminded of God's promises. That God, what God promises in the Bible, he keeps those promises. Now there's one covenant that God made, and uh, that was one that covered all the covenants of the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that is the covenant promise of Jesus Christ. That if by faith you choose to enter that covenant with Jesus, meaning you give your life to Jesus and you decide to live for him, God promises that we will have eternal life and be with him forever. So God makes promises throughout the Bible, and he makes them with us, human beings. And we have a choice to accept those promises and to receive those promises, those promises of God that God never ever goes back on. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, God has made a promise that he will see you in heaven and you will be with your loved ones in heaven. So I hope kids, this has given you good news and um, has made you feel a little bit lighter. So let's pray and thank God that he never breaks his promises. Lord, we thank you for the word covenant and how it means an agreement between us and you that we enter into fully and that you never break your end of the bargain. That is just amazing to me. So we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word. And we know that you never go back on them. In that we can trust. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 2 through 8, and I'm going to read it in the New Revised Standard Version. They, the Israelites, had journeyed from Rehadim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain of God. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my commandment and my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine. 
You shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set them before all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. When I was in middle school, there was a really popular girl who was going to be having a birthday party, and she let everybody know that she was going to be sending the invitations by mail to all of us. So every day I ran to the mailbox for two weeks, and I checked every day, no invitation. Checked again, no invitation. Checked again, no invitation. On the very last day that the mail was to come before her birthday party, I ran to the mailbox one more time, checked again and came to reality that I was not going to receive an invitation. And you know what the worst part of it was? I was going to have to go back to school on Monday and hear from everybody else how wonderful this birthday party was. And you know, I really wish I had some good responses. Well, I went on to Facebook and I found some really good responses if you don't receive an invitation, some things you can say back to people. Number one, you can say, Thanks for excluding me from your event that I would have declined attending anyway. <laughs> Here's another one that you can say back, you know, if you don't need to come up with an excuse to bail when you don't get invited. <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't need to come up with an excuse to bail from that lame party because I wasn't even invited. The next one is, you know, people who don't get invited are like, it's cool. I see how it is. <laughs> or maybe this one. So you didn't invite me to your birthday party. So tell me again while it, why it was so boring. <laughs> That's a good one. Or how about this one? I don't care about you. I don't care what you think about me. I don't think about you at all. Well, that's kind of in your face, isn't it? Or how about this one? When you don't get invited to your friend's birthday party, you can only burn their house down, as this video or this clip just showed you. Or the last one, you know, Sonia didn't invite me to her birthday party. Well, she better enjoy it because it's gonna be her last. <laughs> so those are some things that you could say when you don't get invited. But you know what? It amazes me how upset and hurt we get when we don't receive an invitation. Even as adults, when we don't get added to the luncheon, the co-workers luncheon or asked out to the luncheon, we feel lonely, we feel hurt, we feel like we've done something wrong. And yet there's one person that has offered invitations over and over and over again for thousands and thousands of years and people still say no. God himself sends out invitations for all humanity to enter into a covenant relationship with a holy God. That's amazing. That's better than any popular girl's invitation to her birthday party. So this invitation to covenant with God tells us less about us and all about who God is. And that God has a desire to be in an intimate relationship with with you. That has been his desire. So he has used covenants throughout the Old Testament and the final covenant in Jesus Christ to show you how much he loves you. And he's giving you an invitation, but it's our job to receive that invitation. So we're going to take a look at our scripture today and see what it reveals to us about God, the covenant that God made with the Israelites through Moses after they had escaped Egypt. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what a covenant is. So a covenant we know in our day and time is literally a contract between two or more parties that agree to do something or to not do something. And we have all kinds of covenant agreements. There's covenants between employers and employees. There's covenants between doctors and patients. There's even covenants between husbands and wives in the marriage ceremony, which I just talked to the kids about just a few minutes ago. Basically, the covenant says that two parties promise to do this and to not do that to keep the relationship intact, okay? To keep the relationship intact. So that is a covenant. And in the Bible, a covenant with God 
and his people. God makes promises to his people, and he usually requires some kind of conduct back from his people. God made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with um, Abraham. He made a covenant with David. And we're going to talk about the covenant he made with the Israelites. So to Noah, which I just told you about with the kids' message, he made a covenant never to flood the earth with water, the entire earth with water again, or with a great flood. And so he used the rainbow as a symbol to remind Noah and all of us today that God is never going to do that. God keeps his promises. He promised to Abraham that he that Abraham would become the ancestor of a great nation. And um, he provided Abraham a place to go. So Abraham had a new place to go. So Abraham would become this great nation if he went to the place that he didn't know, but God had told him to do. That was part of the covenant terms. And we know that God kept that promise. God made a promise to David. He said, if you continue to be a man after my own heart, I will keep your ancestors on the throne, of, on the throne for Israel. And to Moses, God said to the Israelites that they would reach the promised land if they obeyed his words and his covenant, or his Mosaic law, which is the Ten Commandments. Now these covenants or promises of God are all initiated by God for the purpose of being with his people. So we have to keep this in mind when we talk about the Ten Commandments. We're not going through all the Ten Commandments individually. I want to talk about why God made the Ten Commandments and why he sent them to Moses to take them down to the people. It's because God needed a way to approach sinful people. And so he made a covenant with them, and the Ten Commandments is part of those terms. So a covenant is less about rules and regulations. It's an invitation to a relationship. So let's talk about the covenant that God made with the Israelites and see what it says about God. So the first thing this covenant reveals about God is that it comes out of a place of God's own heart, God's grace. Before God even gives out the invitation to the Israelites to partake or to enter into a covenant relationship, he reminds them of his gentle care, protection, and concern that he has had for them while they were in Egypt and as they were traveling to the desert for three months as they escaped from Egypt. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Okay, this is an important scripture. Why is God going to send out this invitation to covenant with Israel? Because he wants to bring them to himself. And before he even invites them into this opportunity to accept this invitation, he tells them about the grace that they've already received from him. The care that he showed them, like a when, when they were coming out of Egypt and it was rough and it was hard when they were in Egypt and it was even harder when they were in the desert. You know, they were always looking for water, but God provided. He provided and he protected, just like a mother. He talks about a mother eagle. He goes, how I bore you on eagle's wings. Well, if you know about eagles, when a mother eagle has eaglets in her nest, she has to get them out so they can learn to fly. So she lovingly yet firmly pushes them out of the nest and they start falling, and then they start flapping, and they go. If they don't flap, Mother Eagle comes whoosh right underneath them and grabs them and holds them in her wings and brings them gently back to the nest to try again. So God is saying, I've already shown you grace. I've already shown you love. Now I'm giving you an invitation to receive or to an invitation that you can accept to enter into a personal, intimate relationship with me. You know, God is still showing us grace today. So if anybody tells you there's no grace in the Old Testament, you can tell them that story right there. Because that is grace, folks. Grace that God showed to the Israelites before he even invited them into a covenant relationship with him. So God still shows us grace today. He, he wants to draw himself close to us, and he just might gently but firmly throw us out of a job that he knows is not correct for us or not right for us which will draw us closer to him because we'll be concerned and we'll be worried and all of that. And then he will put us in a better place like that mother eagle puts her eaglets back into the nest, protecting, protecting them and loving them. So all the covenants that are in all of the Bible um, 
are based and started and initiated, if you will, out of God's grace for humanity. So that's the first thing we learn about the covenant of the Israelites. The second thing we learn about this covenant in particular is that what it shows us about God is that God is a gentleman. Listen to God's invitation. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, God invites. He's giving an invitation. When you get an invitation to a party, you can RSVP, yes, I'm going, or you can RSVP, no, I'm not going. So God invites. He never forces the Israelites into this covenant. He didn't say, you need to do this covenant or I'm going to throw some fire down at you. No, nope. he says, therefore, if you obey my voice, his words, and keep my covenant, okay, and then God's going to promise to do something. So God is a gentleman. He's not going to force the Israelites into this or anybody else. Any foreigners that were in with them had the opportunity to join in this covenant. So he says, there's no pressure. Um, you can walk away if you want. Jesus does the same thing today with the new covenant. He's a gentleman. He never forces himself upon believers. Instead, what, God, what Jesus does through the power of the Holy Spirit, what God does through the power of the Holy Spirit, is he woos people into thinking about God or bringing someone that knows about Jesus into their life to see how they live. And so that's what God does to get us focused on Jesus. But he never forces us into the relationship so that's second. God never forces the Israelites into this personal, intimate relationship with him. He simply sends them an invitation. He gives them an invitation to enter into this covenant relationship. And so what are the terms of this relationship? Well, you have to obey his word or his voice, so do what he says, and his, keep his covenant. And his covenant terms are the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments, along with all the other commandments God gave Moses at that time, was a system God set up. He set it up for the Israelites. And so many people think that the Ten Commandments are rules, it's a law book that we have to keep or God will be mad at us. It's the only way, the way, the avenue that God could use to draw us closer to him, a way for him to be in intimate relationship with sinful people. The Ten Commandments is less about um, rules and laws and order and all about a way for God to approach sinful humanity and bring them into a personal, intimate relationship with him. Sometimes I think about who, we're, who we actually are agreeing to be in covenant with. God is God, and there is none like him, the Bible says. God is holy. God is pure, God is sinless, God is powerful, God is loving, God is kind, God is sovereign, God is all-knowing, God is the creator of the universe. He cannot be around sin, and yet we are sinful people. But he loves us so much, and out of his grace, he's going to send an invitation to us, and the terms are, follow these commandments, because that's the way I can be in covenant relationship with you, because I am holy, and you are not. Do you see this? Do you see the difference in the Ten Commandments compared to the way we look at the Ten Commandments? You're just telling me I can't have my neighbor's stuff, but I like his boat, and I want to go out and buy a boat just like him. God wants us to live in a covenant relationship with him and with each other. And with each other. So the first three commandments tell us how to stay in this covenant relationship with a holy God, because that's the only way it's possible for Israelite to approach a holy God, is to stay in covenant with him. The first commandment you are all very familiar with, it says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods but me. God is a jealous God. He won't share our time with our other little G gods, like our jobs and our money and always wanting more material things or power or pride or whatever it is. He can't share time with those other lead other little g gods because God is the one true God. So that means all those other little g gods that we spend more time and more money and more thought on are sinful and God can't be around sinful things. So that is why he says, make no other gods. Don't put any other gods before me. I'm the one true God. And then number two, you shall not make, you shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. When we disrespect God's name, we sin against the Lord. God's name is holy and everything about him is holy. So when we abuse his name, we are sinning. Thus, we are breaking our promise that we made to him 
in this covenant relationship. Do you see? And when we do that, we, we are sinning, and so he can't be by us. Remember, the Ten Commandments is a way for him to draw near to us so that we can draw near to him. And so when we break these commandments, we push God away. We sin and we push him away because he can't be where sin is because he's holy. Number three, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. Again, God made a day, any day, it doesn't have to be Sunday. God made a day and he, he commanded the people to keep that day, set it apart for holy. Think about holiness. Think about me. Think about uh, praising me and lifting me up and worshiping me. So then we don't do that. We just treat every single day the same way then we actually break that promise with God and we sin and we push God away. Are you getting this? I'm getting this. I'm finally getting this. <laughs> so the third way that this covenant shows us about God, this third thing that this covenant shows us about God is that God trusts us to show the world who he is, okay? The other seven commandments are how we treat others in the community of love that is created by God through this covenant, when we refuse to love our enemies, we break our end of the bargain. We break our end of the covenant with God. And not only that, we show the world that we don't really trust God. If we can't get along with our neighbor folks, how do we show the world that we follow a loving God? How do we do that? Tell me how we do that when we backbite and stab and are so full of anxiety that we can't even see straight anymore, that we rely more on worrying about our situation than we do God. Tell me how we are showing the world this holy God. We're not. So these seven commandments, commandment four, no, yeah, seven commandments, four through ten, um, God risks in this covenant, he risks us showing the world who he is through these other commandments. So the last thing, so we know that God takes a risk and he relies on us to show the world who he is through following these commandments. And the last thing this covenant shows us about God is that God will bless us if we remain in this covenant relationship. Scripture tells us that we will be, in God, we will be God's treasured possession out of all the people. So Israel was going to be a treasured possession out of all the other nations, that pagan nations that were around them. This basic meaning is that God, that we are God's personal property. We will be God's dear possession. So think about a man who loves his car. He loves his car. It's a Mustang, and he absolutely loves it. And it's an old one, but it is beautiful. It's been restored, and he's taken love and care, and he makes sure all the vinyl or leather, whatever he's got, is all nicely cleaned and conditioned, and, and he scrubs it, and he lovingly washes it. There's no way he's going to get a dirty sponge that's got rocks in it from my Ford Escape <laughs> and put it on his Mustang, that's his baby. That's his treasured possession. He loves that car, and so he cares for it, and he protects it, and he, um, he loves it. God's treasured possession. We are God's treasured possession. Set apart. Set apart for mission. And what is that mission? This is the other promise God has for us. So when we're a treasured possession, he's going to take care of us. He's going to protect us. He's going to be like that mother eagle that protects us when he asks us to do something hard. He's going to be with us. He's going to love us. He's going to, he's going to show all kinds of attention to us. This is the covenant that we enter into through faith in Christ. This is a covenant that the Israelites were going to enter into. And then he says, indeed, you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Becoming a priestly kingdom and a holy nation means that we're set apart for God's service. We have access, direct access to God through prayer. When he says a priestly kingdom, he's talking about the line of the priests. Back in the Old Testament, the priests and the high priest was the only one once a year that was allowed to enter into the holy of holies to be in the very presence of God. So when he's saying we're a priestly kingdom, he's not talking about being ministers or reverence or pastors he's talking about we have full access to God they were going to have access to God through the high priest that went in and atoned for their sin because that was the Old Testament covenant that they had set up we have access to God our holy God in this covenant relationship through Jesus Christ who is our high priest we pray to him and he brings our prayers to a holy God because Jesus is holy and sinless so we become also God's representative as a holy nation to the world. This was the mission for Israel, and it should be our mission today. They were not to have other gods like the pagan gods. They were not to, um, 
make graven images. They were not to covet their neighbor's wife and because that would separate them from God again and push God away out of that relationship. But it also was to show the nation who they trusted and who the one true God was. They weren't going to listen to a king or a pharaoh or any Egyptian little g-gods anymore. They were going to listen to the one true God and they were going to be faithful. And they would tell the rest of the world about this one true God. First Peter echoes that we have become a priestly kingdom. A priesthood of all believers, he writes in 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen people, chosen by God out of God's grace. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to the one true God, that you may declare the praises of him who are called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Again, the mission is to stay in a covenant relationship with God who keeps his promises. We break our promises to God. And the Israelites, we know did the same. Listen to what happens after this covenant, this invitation to enter into this covenant happens and the people hear what the terms of the covenant are. Moses went back and summoned all of the people and set before them the words that the Lord had just commanded him to speak. The people all responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. But we know the rest of the story. The Israelites didn't do everything what God had said. They didn't obey his voice and they certainly didn't obey his Ten Commandments. But God created a new covenant. God made a new covenant with his people by sending his son Jesus so that all who believe, even though they die, yet shall they live. The covenant reveals to me that God never gives up on us. That is what the covenant relationship of God is all about. And that's what it was all about in the Old Testament. It wasn't about people disobeying God and God's wrath be being put on them and letting the Assyrians attack them. It was all about creating a covenant or a way for God, a holy God, to approach his people and draw them close to him. They could not have drawn close to God because the high priest didn't even want to go into the uh, most holy place because when you looked upon the presence of God, you died instantly. That's why Moses hit the ground when God said, I'm talking to you, and he hit the ground and he hid his face. Read it through the Old Testament. They were not to even say the word G-O-D. If you have some Jewish friends, they might say the word, or they might print out the word God, G-Line-D. They won't spell out even the whole name of God. He's that powerful. He is that holy. He is that majestic. He is that sovereign. And the only way sinful man could ever be near God is for God, out of his grace, to initiate an invitation into a covenant relationship with him. He did that all throughout the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, it stuck. Do you know why? Do you know why it stuck? Because Not because of us but because God kept his promise. The Israelites turned away from God and they made golden calves and they broke the promises. And God says, I still got to keep my promise. I still got to keep my promise that they will be a priestly kingdom and they will be a holy nation and they will be drawn back to me. Well, how did he do that? How did he keep his promise? He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He is the new covenant. He is the way we approach a holy God through faith. And when we do, God promises us in that covenant relationship to protect us, to care for us, and even though we die, yet shall we live forever in his presence. Amen. It's time now for our offering, and I just want to thank the community and the Kingsley United Methodist Church members for your faithful giving. I want to thank you so much for continuing to provide for this church so that we can continue to do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. So let us, um, before we pray, I just want to remind you to continue to send your offerings right into Kingsley United Methodist Church or Kingsley UMC or KUMC, whatever you choose, and send them to P.O. Box 395, Kingsley, Michigan, 49649, or you can go to kingsleymethodistchurch.com and go and pay by PayPal. Let us pray for our offering. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for you have made us your own through Jesus Christ and given us a new righteousness based on faith. 
Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you these gifts with thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, the one God, forever and ever. Amen. Before I close, I just want to tell you that these two prayers that I did during the service, go back and listen to them, the opening prayer and the offering prayer, I wrote these like years ago. And I just said, oh, I don't have time to write a new prayer, so I'm just going to pull these out. I hope they match with the sermon. That offering prayer didn't sound like that message, so I'm going to give God all the credit for that. Of course, we always do, don't we? So you enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you back here again next Sunday.